personally, I don't tend to hold many shares in the big, big FTSE 100 companies. Uh, in my experience, they tend to have done a lot of their growing already. And uh, the share prices, whilst they do go up, they don't go up quite as fast as, you know, some sort of small cap stock that are going to move a thousand percent in the next few years. And so I don't tend to hold many of these big FTSE 100 companies. Um, today, however, we're going to take a look at a company called Unilever PLC. <music> Hey there guys, welcome to the FTSE show with me, Chris Chillingworth, episode number 49 of this show. That's insane. Um, so we're going to take a look at Unilever PLC today. Uh, you'll know who they are. They're a very well-known company uh, across UK stocks and uh, I don't really want to talk too much about it. I'd rather just dive into the numbers. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, let's take a look at Unilever PLC, Epic Code ULVR. They're in the FTSE 100, and these guys are in the household goods sector. So, first of all, we can see that revenue growth has actually been pretty uh, leveled off. It's been rather stagnant from 2012 to 2019. That's eight years. Uh, looking back at 2012, we're sitting at 51.2 billion, so a very large company here. Uh, but look at 2019, 51.9 billion. So we've been lower, we've been higher over those eight years. But uh, overall, what we're seeing is that we're not really going anywhere. We're not really making much progression, much movement in terms of revenue coming in. So what this might suggest, and this often happens with some of these big, big companies like Unilever, is that they kind of reach that peak where they can't really stretch the revenue and bring more revenue in. They've kind of done a lot of their growing already and now they're kind of at that big size where they just tick along doing what they do. Um, that's not to say they can't make more revenue going forward, but they haven't been able to do that by the looks of things over the last eight years, bearing in mind they are bringing in the same kind of revenue they were bringing in back in 2012. So, yeah, not much progression there. Um, looking at the gross margin as well, that seems to be pretty much the same. We're looking at over the last 12 years, gross margin's gone down about 1%. And as you can see here from watching the screen, looking at the numbers that I'm looking at, you know, we've had drops down to 12.6%. We've seen peaks and highs of 24.8%. So it's been a bit of a, you know, we're just not really finding much of a trend. If anything, that trend is flat. And we're not really getting anywhere in terms of seeing a consistent growth in gross margin, which is what I would expect. I wouldn't necessarily expect to see a growth in that gross margin if revenue is about the same, cost of sales is ticking around about the same. And we just, uh, that consistency can be good because we, we know what to expect from Unilever in the future years. But... It doesn't lend itself well to companies that we're looking for that might be growth companies, if you, if you know what I'm saying. Um, interest on debt is relatively high, but not to a point where I would be concerned. $627 million a year being spent on interest on debt. Uh, we come down to the net earnings and... Again, similar sort of story, really. Back in 2008, this, this was a company that was making 12.5% net earnings. And in 2019, so 12 years later, they're making 11.2% net earnings. So you could argue that's pretty much the same. And they've just been dancing around this sort of 11% mark. You can see certain years here falling down to 8%, a couple of 9%s in there, a couple of 10% years. And then we saw in 2018, they had a really good year where cost of sales suddenly dropped off. And the margin increased, therefore, that year. And as a result of that, they made more profit. Um, but the cost of sales then went back to normal in 2019. So that seems to be maybe a flash in the pan, that kind of uh, one-off event, unfortunately, because if that was the way that it was continuing, we start to see some real growth there. But if we were to highlight all these years and look at the net earnings across all these years, we'd have an average net earnings rate of about 10.9%. We can argue and say that's 11%, and that's essentially what they've been earning in 2019. So they're earning about the average of what they've been earning over the last 12 years. So again, no real progression there in terms of the net earnings of this business, of this company. Uh, they're making about the same percent of the revenue that they were bringing in. So, again, not a major issue when it comes to Unilever because, you know, with that 11% essentially of all that revenue is a huge amount of profit. This is a very profitable company, do not get me wrong. It's just not 
a growth company. It seems like Unilever may have done all their growing that they're going to do. Uh, certainly not much growth over the last 12 years. Um, cash is looking very healthy at 4.1 billion. We can see an obvious growth in cash there, certainly over the last five, six years. Um, and we can look at the current ratio. The current ratio is 0 0.8. That's OK. Uh, that means that li current liabilities are slightly above the value of current assets. Uh, but that's not a big, big deal. And that's, again, something that this comp that's again, that's something that this company have been looking at for the last 12 years. So that is very consistent, at least. So the other thing I want to look at is the debt levels. So if we look at the short term debt borrowing, we're looking at 4.7 billion. And if we look at the long term, so this is debt that's owed over the next year or more. Uh, so not not necessarily a, a current liability, but a non-current liability. Uh, we're looking at 23.5 billion outstanding. That is just a little bit too high for me based on earnings. If we were to add those together, we're looking at what's that four point? Let's call that 4.7. So we're looking at 27, 28 billion, right? In outstanding debt. That's combining the short term and the long term debt. For, so. Uh, what did we say? That was 28 billion. Uh, this is a company making currently about 6 billion a year. So we're looking at looking about four to five years to pay that off. It's okay. Um, it's on the high side for me, but it's not a huge, huge problem for me either. Uh, but it does kind of go against them a little bit in terms of their score uh, because I prefer companies that have very little debt outstanding. Looking at the equity value of the business, that's the assets minus the liabilities uh, equals what's left, essentially, what's the equity in that business. Uh, back in 2010, we're looking at 15 billion. Uh, we saw that kind of rise to 16 billion in 2012, uh, 16 billion again in 2015, went up to 17 billion in 2016. So this is, this is just the equity of the business, 17 billion. Which is very good. And then in the last couple of years, we've kind of seen it drop off again. 14 billion down to 12 billion, now back up to nearly 14 billion. So uh, we've seen a bit of a drop off in the equity of the business, but it's not a, a, an obvious trend downwards. It looks like we've made a bit of a jump up in 2019. So not fantastic. Again, just kind of suggests that there's a lack of growth there within the business. Uh, this is not a growth company, obviously. Um, in terms of retained earnings, we've seen a bit of a drop off here. We're seeing at 23 billion in 2016, that went up to 26 billion in 2017, stayed there in 2018, and then down to 18 billion in 2019. So they've got 18 billion in retained earnings, but we've seen a drop off of about 30% over the last couple of years, which is uh, relatively significant. Uh, and it kind of goes against them a little bit because I like to see companies with retained earnings that are growing and growing and growing, not going the opposite direction. Now, obviously, they may have used some of that for acquisitions, but then we haven't really seen much of a growth in equity either. So that's a bit of a shame. Uh, return on shareholder equity is very good at 41.9%. So of the assets or of the equity that the company has, they're making a good return on that equity. Um, and overall, what we're looking at here, I guess, is really pretty straightforward. This is a very good company making very good profits. Uh, you can rely on them to make about 11% a year net earnings. Uh, but don't expect them to grow much in terms of the value of the business, in terms of the revenue. Maybe they will in the future, but there's really no sign of that over the last kind of at least the last eight years. They've not really grown much since 2012. Uh, and unless something big is in the pan, something, something really significant that's talking, we're talking about 10 billion worth of uh, revenue coming in difference unless something like that's happening with Unilever I wouldn't expect to see much change in terms of growth of this company there are a few metrics here that are pointing downwards not upwards uh, there are also some metrics that are pointing upwards and it's really a kind of uh, you can rely on them to be there you can rely on them to stick around you can rely on them to be pumping in about 10 to 11 percent net earnings a year but don't expect them to grow much and uh, we'll take a look at the uh, share price and see how that's been doing on the charts. Okay, so we're looking at a monthly chart and you have to say that looks pretty impressive, right? Uh, back in 2008, when we started picking up that data, we were looking at a share price of about £19. We're now at £43 some 12 years later. So that is some significant growth. And uh, I guess the consistency of a company that's pumping in 10% a year that you can rely upon is an investor's dream to a certain extent. 
Uh, obviously, the, gro the lack of growth means that Unilever are not a company that I would probably invest in myself. I prefer to invest my money into growth companies, uh, companies that are likely to uh, yet, yet, uh, yet to do their growth. Uh, Unilever, I would worry now at this stage, uh, unless you were a, an investor you know, 10 years ago, in which case they've been a great investment, my worry now is that uh, they've done a lot of their growth. They're probably not going to grow much more than they have done, they are doing now. Uh, and that my capital might be better invested elsewhere. That might be a tragic mistake that I'm making, and I appreciate that, I know that. Uh, no one knows is the bottom line, so you can only make uh, the most informed decision that you can. And some of you will be watching this and thinking, nah, these guys look great to me, I'm going to invest. In which case, you know, more power to you. Uh, for me, they just don't tick all my boxes and I can't invest in every company. So I'm very picky about the companies I invest in. I've only got about 40 companies that so far have ticked all my boxes. Unfortunately, Unilever don't do that, but they will score some points. So let's go and take a look and see how they did on the leaderboard. Okay, so let's take a look at the price. Uh, current price is £43.40 pence for a share in Unilever. Is that too much? Well... Uh, earnings per share of two pound fourteen a share. That would suggest a if you were to buy all the shares at forty three pound forty, uh, and owned the outstanding shares that were were available, you'd be making four point nine percent a year return, which is okay. That would suggest to me, based on that, that the forty three pounds was adequate. It was okay. You know, it wasn't overpriced. It wasn't underpriced. It was a fair reflection of the value of that company uh, a bargain would be you know 40 pounds maybe 35 pounds would be a good price to get into Unilever and remember what I always say that the price is separate entirely to the caliber of the company the financials of the company uh, and whether or not they're a good investment or not is a different uh, ball game to are the shares priced correctly? And so we're looking at are the shares priced correctly. At 4.9% return, what I'm suggesting therefore is that the shares are probably are. They're probably priced correctly. Um, another way to look at that is look at the uh, the uh, equity per share or the, the price to book ratio. Uh, we've got, let's see, 13.8 billion in equity in this company and 2.6 billion shares outstanding so that would work out about five pounds 34 per share so for every 30 43 pound share that you buy you're getting five pound 34 of assets that gives us a price to book ratio of 7.8 that's pretty high uh, and as a result that would suggest that the price is a bit too high and so what we've got there is we've got looking at earnings we're looking at a company that probably priced about right to their value you're not getting a great deal but you're not also overpaying if you're looking at the assets of the company that price is a bit too high uh and so for me yeah i would say i generally combine the two and i would say that the shares are probably a little bit too on the higher side for me they're too high for what i would be interested in that price to book ratio is not good enough for me and the 4.9 percent earnings is not good enough for me uh i like to see better results better numbers than that for me to get in and so the share price for me is a bit too high but it's about fair i would say for the company it's just not a great deal um so time to get them up on the board uh they are gonna score they are gonna do okay let me get my pen What you've got to bear in mind is that uh, the growth of a company plays a big part, I know, but the scoring algorithm that I use uh, definitely rewards growth trends, trends in the numbers, trends in the financials. Uh, are there trends to suggest that the company is growing and going in the right direction? If they are, if they're growing year and year and year and it looks like they're just continuously growing, they're going to score much better than a company that's just not growing at all, that's kind of stagnant, not really going anywhere. Uh, but that company is going to grow uh, and score far better than a company that are going downwards in trends. So trends play a very important part here. Um, so Epic Code is ULVR. These guys score... A rather standard 35 points so I'm gonna get them up on the board first of all 
Okay, so up there with the likes of uh, IAG, uh, Associated British Foods, BT. Uh, maybe the scoring is a little bit harsh on them, perhaps. Uh, I expected them to score a little bit higher. I expected them to be like maybe a 50-odd company on the scoring. Uh, but too many of their trends pointing in the wrong direction hampered their ability to score highly. Uh, for me, these guys were never going to be a company that I was particularly interested in investing in. Uh, I'm looking for a whole different caliber of company. I'm looking for growth stocks, companies that are going to grow free 400% over the next 10 years or so. Uh, I want big, big, strong companies that have got great opportunity to grow. I feel like Unilever's already done that growth. If you're looking for a company that's just going to churn out 10% return earnings every single year, but not really grow too much uh, in the next sort of 10 years, then Unilever is a, a good bet. Uh, they've got dividend of 3.3%, so they're not even really a strong dividend uh, stock. Um, yeah, kind of. I feel kind of meh about Unilever. Um There'll be, there, there are fans out there. I know there are fans out there, but for me, just not quite doing it. Uh, we've lost Royal Mail off the list, and that is the final casualty of the minus numbers. So any company that scores below zero now won't even make it onto the leaderboard. We won't even be drawing up a card for them. That is the last company with minus numbers now. The caliber of the board is improving every single week. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the episode, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Cheers. Oh, 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 oh,